Sometimes you'll hear people say that vintage Stanley planes with their original thin irons just don't work very well. And if you want good performance out of a tool like this, you have to switch that iron out with a modern, thicker replacement iron. And if you don't make that change, well, this is just a quaint antique, and it's going to sit on the shelf collecting dust. That's just not true, and I'll prove it right now. Here's a selection of vintage Stanleys, all with their original thin irons, and this is a piece of walnut. Here's a number three. <laughs> Here's a number four. Here's a four and a half. And here's a five. Obviously, these planes all work fine. So, why do so many people say you need to replace the iron? This video is going to be a review and a test of the Hawk Tools replacement plane iron. Hawk plane irons are thicker than a vintage Stanley, and for the chip breaker, they use a thicker piece of machined steel, where the Stanley uses a thin piece of stamped mild steel. If you'd just like to see that review, go ahead and skip ahead in the video. For everybody else, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of plane irons. For instance, a lot of people say that Stanley used a thin iron for cost savings. They were trying to save a little bit of money. But that doesn't make any sense. When Stanley released their adjustable metallic planes in the late 1800s, they cost double what you would have paid for a comparable wooden plane. If you're coming into the market with a product that's that much more expensive, you're already not competing on price. And if you expect people to buy your super expensive competitor, well, you better make everything about it as good as possible. Stanley planes were made from cast iron, which was a newer technology and obviously much more expensive than wood. They used imported rosewood for the handles, and everywhere your hand touches, they used corrosion-resistant brass fittings, when they could have used steel or they could have used domestic hardwoods instead. And you can see this because cheaper competitors did use cheaper parts in their knockoff Stanley planes. The Stanley wasn't just supposed to be a well-thought-out, well-functioning tool, it was supposed to be luxurious. It was the premium tool of its day. So with all of that care and money put into the manufacturing, why would Stanley cheap out on the iron, the most important part of the whole thing? And why are these irons even considered thin? I mean, thin compared to what? Here's the iron out of a wooden plane, and as you can see, it is a lot thicker than a Stanley iron. These thick irons do perform really well in wooden planes, but they weren't thick just because of performance. That size was also just a consequence of the way they were manufactured. Back during the glory days of wooden planes, high carbon tool steel was really expensive. So manufacturers made their irons by laminating a little piece of tool steel called a bit onto a bigger piece of wrought iron or soft steel using a process called forge welding. Now, we're used to welding in the modern context, where you just butt two pieces of steel up against one another, run a bead up the middle, and they stick together. But forge welding isn't like that. In the forge welding process, the two pieces have to overlap, and then they're heated together and they're struck to make them into a single piece. When you're laminating using forge welding, you're just going to end up with a thicker iron. There's no way around it. Now, what was special about the Stanley irons is they actually made the entire thing out of high carbon tool steel. So there is a lot of high carbon steel here. And Stanley hardened either the entire blade or they hardened all the way up to the slot. So you could sharpen this thing until there was nothing left and you still had a good cutter. But this begs the question, if Stanley was throwing so much money and technology at their new plane design, well, why not just make the irons a tiny bit thicker? Well, it's because of sharpening. Sharpening happens in two stages. First, grinding the iron removes some of the bevel, maintaining the correct angle and a little bit of clearance. Then, honing makes the edge sharp again. When the Stanley plane was first introduced, multi-stone sharpening setups like the one I'm using here were unknown in Europe and America. My two coarse stones, which actually handle the grinding, these are artificial stones. They didn't even exist back then. Most craftspeople just owned a single stone, like this natural black Arkansas stone. 
Now, this is a great sharpening stone, which is why I still use it, but it's too fine to handle grinding. It's really only good for refreshing the edge. It's not going to grind that bevel away and keep your geometry. And if you sharpen without grinding, the bevel really quickly gets too fat and the iron stops cutting. In his classic book about Victorian woodwork, The Village Carpenter, Walter Rose remembers that the fine stone could only be used a few times before recourse to the grindstone was had immediately the sharpening bevel became wide. The wide bevel just couldn't be maintained using only a fine stone. At this time, round, sandstone grinding wheels were common in workshops. Every couple of sharpenings, the workman would stop and grind the bevel of his tool at the wheel getting the geometry back into shape. Especially with the thick irons of the time, sharpening was a chore and really interrupted the flow of work. Rose recalls that in his day, even the very best stones were dreadfully slow and all demanded an abnormal amount of labor. Stanley knew that workmen faced these problems and that grinding wheels were often not available for on-site work like house carpentry. In the company's own history of hand planes, Stanley points out the desirability of a thin steel cutter of uniform thickness, which could be kept in condition by honing only, and whose original bevel could therefore be more easily maintained. Stanley knew the challenges faced by workers who had only a single stone, and maybe didn't always have access to the grinding wheel. The thin Stanley iron could be maintained using nothing but the fine stone. At the time it was released, the thin Stanley iron wasn't a bug, it was a feature. Of course, Times have changed. I mean, now we have multi-stone sharpening setups with coarse stones, and we have inexpensive electric grinders that let us really quickly get our bevels back into shape. Since our sharpening technology has changed so much, it's probably time for more people to think about trying one of these thicker irons. Now for this video, I've picked a Hock iron. Ron Hock was one of the first people, maybe the first person, to offer a replacement iron for Stanley Plains. He has a really good reputation, and also his irons are designed to be a little bit thicker than a vintage Stanley, but still thin enough to install in the plane without any modifications. I don't have to file the mouth open or anything like that. This is the perfect iron for me to test in the Stanley Plains that I depend on day to day. Now, with any plane iron, the first thing I'm going to do is check and make sure the back of the iron is flat enough, and I'll flatten it if it needs a little bit of work. <laughs> this one does look really good. I don't think it's going to need much attention. Here's a thousand grit diamond plate. I'll add a little bit of water to that, and then let's just work the edge of the iron a little bit. Nice and flat on the stone, and okay, so that iron is mostly flat. I have a little bit of a low spot right there, but this diamond plate is cutting really well. I think I can stick with the thousand grit. Okay, that's nice and flat all the way across the back. It's really perfect. Now I'm going to move to a finer stone, and let's work that just a little bit more and see if we can bring it to a higher polish. There. That's a flat and polished back, and I did it in just a couple minutes. It was very quick. Thick irons are supposed to take a long time to sharpen, so I'm going to run this hock iron through my whole normal sharpening setup. And we're also going to time it. And because Stanley irons are supposed to be faster, we are also going to sharpen this one at the same time, and we'll time this one too. This iron is razor sharp, and it took 1 minute and 37 seconds to sharpen. And the Stanley took 1 minute and 21 seconds. So not a big difference. Of course, the only thing to do now is test this iron. So I've got two planes here. This is my favorite smoothing plane. It's a Stanley number no. 4 Sweetheart from the late 1920s, and this is a Union plane. It is an extremely close copy of the Stanley made around the same time. These planes are the closest I have to two identical planes in my shop, and of course I have the Hawk iron set up in the Union plane. Now, after having looked at the Hawk and sharpened it and worked with it for a couple of hours, I strongly suspect I'm going to see a difference in the way these two irons work. But there's only one way to find out. Okay, I haven't done any off-camera testing, so these are going to be my first impressions. Here's a piece of reclaimed softwood. I think it's fur. And we will start off with my regular sweetheart with the thin 
iron. This is the stock tool. I think I'm a little bit against the grain there. Let's flip it. That feels better. Okay. I think that's about the best shaving I ever get from one of my planes. It's wide, it feathers out at the edges, and the surface of the wood is extremely smooth and shimmery. Yep, that's about the best I ever get from my stock planes. Now let's bring in the hawk iron and give that a try. I'm gonna start with no iron and start advancing it. Good, that's a pretty similar shaving. Needs a bit of lateral. Mm, not bad. Mm, good. Now this is a similar shaving, but it is a bit wider. And I do notice a little difference in pushing the plane, it feels I don't know, a little better engaged, I guess. Now that, that was interesting because that is a really wide shaving. It's very close to being the full width of the iron. It's really nice. I would say I notice a small but noticeable difference on the softwood. Let's move over to a piece of walnut. This is the wood that I started the video with. Again, starting with the thin iron Stanley. This is another very good shaving, very representative of what I usually get from my Stanley. It's perfect. Now let's try the Hawk iron. Okay, again, um, a very good shaving, quite thin, similar to the Stanley, not, not a huge difference. Surface quality is excellent. And again, I would say it's probably a little bit wider. The shaving is falling apart, so it's tough to tell. Let's try a piece of red oak. Here's a pretty difficult piece. There was a knot somewhere in here. So there's going to be tear out on this no matter which direction you go. So this is a challenging piece of wood. We'll start with the Stanley, thin iron. It's a good cut. Planes always work better with a bit of lubrication. Mm. A little tough to push through there. Back that off a little. So you can see this is a very feathery shaving. This quarter sawn really falls apart as you plane it. And the surface is very good here, but then over in here, the grain starts to reverse and there's light tear out. Not a big problem, but this is a challenging piece of wood. If we're gonna see a difference, I think it'll be here with this piece. Let's see. I will admit on this oak, I feel that, that better sense of engagement, like the plane is just, it's biting in more easily. Good. Now there is one downside here, which is the hawk iron has jammed and there are shavings in between the chip breaker and the iron. This happens all the time. I don't think it's necessarily a reflection on the iron. I'll take a second and clear this and then we'll work on another piece of wood. Okay, the jam is cleared. We're gonna go back to testing. Here's a nice piece of mahogany. So we're not just testing domestic North American. Start with the Stanley with the thin iron. Wow. 
I mean, I know mahogany is, is often quite easy to work with. That's a great shaving. It's really wide and it's very thin. It's really nice. The hock is ready to go again. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and say the hawk is a little bit better, wider, and uh, the surface is outstanding. Look at that. Beautiful shimmery finish. Let's try the hawk on the oak again. This was what caused it to jam in the first place. Well, this time the hawk didn't jam at all. Uh, it performed really beautifully. But the piece of wood is the same as it was with the thin iron Stanley. Really good until we get to the reversing grain. And then just like you'd expect, a tiny bit of tear out on the reversing grain. And I think I would get that with pretty much any hand plane I own. <laughs> Let's go back to the thin Stanley. And yeah, it's, it's really the same. The shavings are the same width. The surface is excellent with a tiny trouble spot. The differences are just, they're very subtle. Man, I have just bounced around all over the place today. I started out my day feeling very skeptical of these thick irons and just thinking, you know what, my thin irons work fine, it's not gonna make any difference. And then as I was sharpening and preparing the hock iron, I was really blown away by the quality of the construction, how rigid it felt, how well machined it was. And I started to change my mind, I thought, this. This has to make a big difference. It's, it's really very different than the original iron. And then of course, I got them both into planes and I tried them out and the difference between them was subtle. I mean, it's there. The Hawk iron is better, for sure. But it's not a huge difference. It's not the difference I've heard people talk about. It's not the difference that I was expecting. It reminds me a lot of a couple months ago when I tried out a bedrock plane for the first time. Those are legendary. They're supposed to be much better than Bailey's, but I found them to be, I don't know, similar. And look, the testing you saw me do on camera, that wasn't all of it. I got a bunch of wood, different species, and tried out both of these planes a lot more. And still, I thought the differences were hmm, modest, kind of subtle. So let's get down to brass tacks here. Should you buy one of these extra thick hock irons with its special machined chip breaker? Well, it depends. If you have a plane that's already working really well, I don't think I'd spend the money. I love my Stanley Sweetheart Bailey style smoothing plane. Um, you see it in a lot of my videos because it's, it's the best plane I own. It was good when I got it and I have tuned the living hell out of it. It's a great performer, and I don't think upgrading the iron would make much of a difference. Now, this Union plane is also a good plane. It was the first smoothing plane I ever owned, and I used it day to day for like a year. And putting the Hawk iron in, well, it's, it's made a difference. It's improved this plane. I think if you have a good quality vintage plane that needs an iron because the old one is chipped or twisted or dented or whatever, well then, instead of buying a cheap new iron, why not spend a couple extra bucks if you take the body of a really high quality vintage plane and combine it with a beautifully machined new iron, you're probably gonna have a really good blade, a really good tool that's gonna last you the rest of your life. So that's the direction I would go in. If it's already working, leave it alone. If it needs help, spend a couple extra bucks. And listen, if you're interested in planes, you might want to check out my specialty plane bundle, which teaches you how to make a bunch of stuff that you probably need in your shop. It's got a rabbit plane, a grooving plane, a router plane. It's got a free bonus project. It's six plans for a very reasonable price, and I've got a video for each one of them. You can pick that up at rexkruger.com store or click on the link down in the description. And this video would never be possible without my amazing patrons on Patreon. I paid full retail for this iron, I pay full retail for everything in my videos, and I have no financial relationship with any tool manufacturer. So whether you buy one of these or not doesn't make any difference to me because I don't make any money. This channel is independent and unsponsored.
And it stays that way because I'm sponsored by my patrons. If you'd like to be one of those people and get a bucket load of rewards, go on over to patreon.com slash rexkruger and check out everything I've got for the people who make this content possible. I'll see you next week with another great woodworking video. Thanks for watching.